first of all, I want to welcome everyone to the select board meeting of <coughs> November the 16th? 15th. 15th. Um, and uh, first, uh, we need to approve the agenda. Are there any changes or um, um, amendments to the agenda as presented? Yeah, there's one that we'd like to add. Uh, can be under manager's items um, to talk about the um, penalty for late filing of homestead declarations. As you do that as, as E? Sure. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? There being none, I, uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Motion. <coughs> any, any other comments on the changes or if not, uh, if we could move the agenda, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. Okay, thank you. Agenda passes. Uh, we have the consent agenda item. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda item. Thank you, Katie. I'll second. second. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danny. Any other comments on the consent agenda items? There being none. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any, there being none opposed, uh, motion passes. Uh, this is, a, it's approximately 7.03, we're right on time. This is the time where we have any folks from the public uh, can comment if they are going to speak about something that, that is already on the agenda, if they can wait for uh, that item in the agenda and you're more than welcome to speak then. If anyone wants to make some comments, uh, you're welcome to do now. And if you can, keep it within two minutes. Thanks. Uh, from my seat or... Uh, come on up. Actually, I have a, a cousin. I didn't expect to be here tonight. He's on the screen. <laughs> Hi, cuz. Hey, cuz, how you doing? Man? Good to see you. Uh, secondly, I'd like to... Uh, Salute these gentlemen, some of the finest, and that comes from a, a nephew down in North Carolina serving his community who just came up here and traded in his patch, proudly taking one of your patches back. Thank you, sir. Some of the finest gentlemen, some of the finest. <clears throat> Cuz, I only got yeah. two minutes. I could use probably 10, okay? I've been to this board five years ago, I believe it was. I think you were there. Yeah. I'm a staunch advocate of affordable housing. I'm here tonight on the absolute thousands of Vermonters throughout the state, the hundreds of Vermonters in this community, and how many more, cousin, within six or seven months are gonna come out of that school system, okay, as Highlanders, as alumni, and how many are coming back from college, and where are we as a community gonna house them? I've spent 40 years of my life, cousin, down in Richmond. I've just built a street, I've named it Perpetual Lane, and seven of my 10 units have been converted and they've been sold through the housing trust. If this town does not start doing those same things, similar cause, not individuals, but the community in the town, I don't see a future for the younger generation here. I think you as a political leader owe them to look them in the eyes or write something publicly or state it publicly that it's in their best interest to fight for their future here or to pack their bags and go find their dreams somewhere else. This is not sustainable, cuz. Have you researched what happens to a society, to a community when you lose and you don't have affordable housing? We're in the first to second phase, cousin. I, I, I never would have imagined this, or I would have never imagined the traffic on Route 100 when we were boys. I've went to numerous towns, cuz I He's hear a lot of- Address the board. Oh, excuse me, I'm right. sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Sure, Bill, thank you, thank you. okay? I've addressed the community by my workmanship here in this building with my company, with the church. So I apologize, Bill, on that. No, no problem. Okay, no, I feel I should, sir. Okay, 
in saying that to the board, okay? I lost my train too, Bill, darn it. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> To the board. Could you also say, I don't know if you say your name. And My name is Jeff Atwood. Okay. Okay. I own property on 3250 Waterbury Stone Road. I also own property 58 Perpetual Lane in Richmond. I've spent my life, my majority of my life in Richmond. I'm in commercial construction. I built municipal facilities here in the community and throughout the state of Vermont, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hard not to look at you, even though I'm trying to adjust the board. <laughs> so, I've used my two minutes, probably more. I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to bring affordable housing to this community. But I'm not gonna do it without seeing it from a community that wants it. I wanna see a community that wants all men and women of all colors, all race, all communities represented. I, just Jeff, it's a little retort. Um, I've had a career in affordable housing. Uh, I'm a longtime member of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. I'm a strong believer in affordable housing, and I think we 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 can do what we can, but we have to be brought to projects. And, and what we can do to promote, I know in in the zoning rewrites, we're probably going to be trying to be as positive as we can <coughs> on creating affordable housing, but Again, we're a select board. We can't necessarily bring the projects. We would love to see projects come into town. We have some that have done that. We need more. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, sir, we're on the same side. Right. Uh, I would also say, as an advocate like you, it's very difficult for me to drive by looking up on the hill at how many units up on the hill? 80, 100, not one unit. Sir, mm -hmm. is perpetually affordable? It's a big issue, Jeff, and, uh, you know, us, the group in the construction industry talking about it all the time, the real estate industry talking about it all the time, its impact on the locals. Um, you know, I was just talking to a game warden today who was telling me about you know, people in California selling their houses out there. The average value of the home in California is $880,000 to a million dollars. They're selling there and going down to Florida. There's no, there's no um, inventory down there because it's getting bought up, you know, um, by people that are moving in down there. And the same thing's happening here. Um, people have the affordability to come up here because they're selling out where they are and they, they've got the pocket change to pay 50, 60,000 more than the average local person. And um, it's, it's shoving their ability to even consider a home right out the door. With all due respect, cause I've spent 15 years being an advocate, studying it, understanding it, seeing what comes down the road. I've seen the bus going into the ditch with the school kids in it. So all I'm simply saying with my last 30 seconds is, I want to do something. I want to do it right off Route 100. I want to put a big billboard up. I want to say, this is what Waterbury, this is what the future of Vermont is. Affordable housing. And cuz, I'll tell you how I feel, and to this board directly, you need a housing boom. You are way out of balance to provide a future. A future like we had, you need to build thousands of homes. And I know how hard that is to swallow. I don't like it myself. But we squandered 15 years. We put it in writing in legislation in 2005 Declare your designations of where you're going to build affordable housing. And for 15 years, imagine if a governor, when he bought 20 acres, would have shown and led by example, I'm going to build affordable housing because we need it. And imagine if we would have built thousands of homes at 0 to 2% interest. Oh my goodness. And if there's one thing I've learned, and I believe most of us in this room have learned by now, 
it's the squashed, and it's the missed opportunities in life that you take with you forever. We missed an opportunity because it's gonna take some hard, long work. 10 years, I'm predicting. I'm saying it publicly right now. It's not up to me, and it really shouldn't be up to us. It should be up to that generation that needs it. If they see it, and they understand what's happened, maybe, just maybe, they'll fight hard enough for it. I don't know yet, but I know I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna holler and scream for it. Because that's the only chance we have as business owners. Okay? <laughs> I can go on and on tonight. Yeah, Thank well, you for your time. I really yeah. appreciate it. I wish you all a happy holiday, okay? Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, this is not something that we're gonna solve in a few minutes here. It's probably something that's good for a future select board meeting, maybe focus more directly on affordable housing, or maybe even a separate you know, meeting that we could discuss to have developers have uh, housing advocates in, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are interested in affordable housing in the community. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Thanks, Jeff. Any other public comment? If there's no other public comment, we'll get to our select board agenda. Uh, the first item is to consider the appointment of a library commissioner. Um, she's here. Uh, she's here. Hi, I'm Margaret Moreland. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm Margaret Moreland, and I moved. Um, I moved to Vermont about eight years ago now. Um, I worked in libraries my whole. <laughs> worked in libraries my whole life. My first job was when I was 14. I was a page in the local library. Um, my last job, I was a law librarian in a law school in New York. Um, and I think I have a lot to, I have a lot of experience, so <clears throat> I would like to make use of that and, and volunteer, so. Do you have any questions? Do we have any questions to the board for Margaret? Can you remind us the term that's open for the uh, three months. Right. Oh, right. So she it's through. Was, it would be through town meeting. meeting. Right. Until town meeting. She would do a petition in January. I'll send a reminder to run for unexpired three-year term in March. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? And are you planning on continuing for the two years after that? Or or just yes. 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 As long as I can <laughs> keep going. <laughs> it will also be another five-year term open. She could also choose another one. Mm -hmm. Library commissioners have recommended both. That was going to be my question. So that has been something yeah, that's been recommended by the They've advertised, they interviewed, uh, there were three candidates that were interviewed, and this is the candidate that they're recommending for appointment. I mean, the law says the select board makes the appointment, but the library commissioners have recommended, uh, I've written over your name. So Mark. Margaret Moreland to the board. I don't have, sounds like you have good experience and I, I, I wish you luck at the as a library commissioner. I make that motion to appoint Margaret as the library commissioner. Thank you. Second? We'll second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, we'll vote. Welcome oh, aboard, Margaret. Welcome to the library. Thanks so much for being well. Thank you. Thank you for wanting to serve. Okay, next item. Conversation with the state police. I'm so glad as, uh, to be here, especially as rep representative of the Central Vermont uh, State Police Advisory Board. Uh, we really appreciate you. I don't know, I know, Kyle, you were at the uh, picnic. I was at the picnic, yes. Yeah. We, we, we were really glad to, to show and we really appreciate um, what you all do. I think the contract with the state police has worked quite well. And we want to have you here as kind of an open open dialogue as maybe I'll open it up to you what you, what you guys see as 
things that are working, maybe things that need to be improved, uh, et cetera. So first, Mike, this is Lieutenant White, yes. who's the station commander, and maybe you, kind of, you can introduce your troops to the yes, so, us. And so uh, obviously, we're, um, I'm, as the representative from the state police, I'm very happy that we have uh, entered into our second um, contract with the, with the town of Waterbury. I feel that, okay. that um, I've been fortunate enough to be here through the entire tenure of the first contract, and I feel that everything, you gotta take this off, I am vaccinated, so. Um, I feel that everything has worked uh, out very well. Um, this year, uh, just out of, out of sheer, uh, I don't know, just, I don't know. The, these two guys uh, joined us. It, it was nothing that was planned. Um, the, uh, the former day shift uh, trooper, Keith Luia, uh, deployed earlier in the year. Um, and Trooper Ryan Riegler stepped up to the plate and uh, stepped into our day shift position. And then a little bit, a few months later, I guess, um, the night shift trooper, Joe Shireko, uh, put in for a transfer back to uh, New Haven and Trooper Tyler Rancourt uh, put in for that position. So we're uh, lucky to have two new tro troopers to kind of bring in the, the beginning of the, the second contract year. Um, and again, I think that uh, everything has been working very, uh, very smoothly, at least from, from our vantage point. Um, you know, on a monthly basis, when I prepare the uh, the monthly recaps to um, the select board, it's uh, it's pretty random as far as uh, we could go from you know having 110 calls in a month down to 60 calls in a month. So there, there's really uh, no nothing that I could put my finger on in terms of trends. Um, I know the the last year and a half, almost two years now, it's been difficult for uh, for everyone with. With COVID, we've gone through a different, uh, numerous different response levels, which limited our, our contact with the public and what we actually allowed the troopers uh, to do throughout the state, which kind of varied what uh, what our responses look like to, to different things. Um, definitely, it, it has affected our, our motor vehicle work. Um, and again, it's just to err on the side of caution to keep uh, the, the troopers and the public safe and to limit contact across the board. Uh, just in the last year though, um, just for the town of Waterbury, um, the state police has responded to well over a thousand uh, calls for service, a um, thousand and twelve to be exact. Um, out of those thousand and twelve calls for service, we've uh, managed to make 119 arrests based on um, those calls. We've conducted um, Pretty close to 500 traffic stops with uh, 239 traffic citations or tickets issued and 218 warnings. So, even under uh, under the COVID protocols and restrictions, I think we still uh, did the town of Waterbury a decent amount of service. Um, the calls, like I said, they vary from month to month, and there's really no no rhyme or reason for it. Um, but uh, just the the latest one that uh, I just submitted. To, uh, the town manager today for uh, for October, there was uh, nearly 100 calls for service, and the troopers um, took about two thirds of those calls. The the uh, the contract troopers took about two thirds of those calls. So um, it uh, again varies from month to month, but um, we're definitely doing some some good work out there. To the um, calls for service for the year, you said around a thousand. Um, does that include the motor vehicle stops, or is that the motor vehicle stops in addition to those calls? Yes, the, the motor vehicle stops are, are not considered a, a call for service. These are just, um, you know, everything from, you know, assaults to larcenies to frauds to vandalisms to, you know, uh, arrest warrants and things like that. Those are the calls for service. And then additionally, the, you know, 450 or so uh, motor vehicle interactions that we've, that we've made. That's good. And just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, the public in particular, the, the, uh, the town's contract is 80 hours, so 40 hours for each of these troopers. And we have a day shift that's what, Tuesday through? Uh, Monday, Monday, Monday through Friday, through Friday. Um, eight, to, eight to five, and then the, uh, the night shift works Tuesday through Saturday, five to two a.m.
in first of all, thank you all for your service. I know I come from a, a law enforcement family, so I really appreciate what, what all you guys do. Um, I'm going to leave it first. You know, I have maybe a few questions, but I'll leave it to the, uh, the board members if they have questions. Can I ask a question? <laughs> I'm answered already. So you can okay. pick it up if you Chris? want. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I appreciate you coming tonight, uh, Lieutenant White, and as well the other officers, and uh, welcome them to Waterbury's uh, serving the town of Waterbury. Um, in the last year and a half, throughout the state, have you seen uh, a de general decline or uptick? I mean, I know it's hard to gauge because of the COVID restrictions, but um, crime as a whole throughout the state in the last year, year and a half, has it kind of been on an even keel or is it, have you seen an increase or a decrease? Um, I think just as a, as a general rule, it's, it's increased. And I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, the, the restrictions that the, the department put on the troopers for actually being, being out there. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the proactive work, which turns into a lot of the, the deterrence for criminal activity, um, the ability to do that was sort of taken away from us, um, under the umbrella of trying to be a little bit more cautious to, to limit the, um, the, the interaction that, you know, we all had with, with the general public. So as a, as a general rule, I would definitely say that, that uh, crime has, has certainly um, increased a little bit. And now that we're kind of, I don't want to say back to normal, but we're trying to get back there, um, I'm hoping to see that uh, they get back to where it was and then maybe a little, a little bit better. I think originally when uh, we originally contracted with the Vermont State Police there for services here in Waterbury out of Middlesex, uh, I believe at the time you, you guys were uh, employing 15 troopers out of, out of the Middlesex barracks with the, I'm thinking with the additional two here to Waterbury that brought it to 17. Is it still at 17 or have you since employed more uh, or less? Yeah, our see. numbers, <laughs> our numbers should be, um, we should have uh, 14 uh, troopers in Middlesex plus four um, sergeants, and then uh, the, the two Waterbury troopers are in addition. So I should have uh, 20 that, that uniform troopers that work in Middlesex. Um, right now, today, where we set uh, from those 20, we have uh, two vacancies and three people are deployed currently and one is on a, uh, a longer term uh, training assignment but it's to get a new uh, patrol dog trained up so we welcome that uh, that absence for now because it's definitely going to to benefit uh, the state in the long run but yeah we're um, in Middlesex we're uh, unlike any other uh, barracks throughout the state we are our staffing level is has decreased, um, but that's the national trend. Everyone, everyone's having staffing issues in, in law enforcement in general. So back again, when, back when we contracted with the state police, again, I thought we were, Middlesex had 15 officers serving 17 towns. Um, with the current staff you have now, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, wasn't there the availability if they needed to call the trooper or troopers from Waterbury to assist with other with other issues in other towns? Wasn't there that availability as part of the contract? Well, the, the, the troopers that are here are assigned to Waterbury and that's where their assignment is for their 40 hours a week. I'm sure that if there was uh, an incident that uh, another trooper needed backup assistance, and these folks were closest, they would certainly go and we would, we would encourage that and want to see that. But I believe right. for the most part, these gentlemen are here in Waterbury unless there's a, an urgent situation that calls them somewhere else. Yeah, that's correct. The, um, the, at, at, the, at the present time, we have uh, a number of shifts that, that we fill on a, on a monthly basis on, uh, on overtime. 
and that's open to, uh, to every, to all the troopers. Um, it would be just an absolute, you know, drop of the hat emergency where, where we would have to, to pull the Waterbury trooper, but uh, it's, it's definitely not a, um, it's nothing that, that we would schedule. These guys are, are here in Waterbury and under um, just drop of the hat sort of emergencies would they be pulled. Yeah, I don't have any issues with that that scenario whatsoever. I just didn't know in the last couple of years that we've had to contract if you've had to had to use that resource for anything. There's been an issue where for some reason you, you had to pull off one of our officers here to, to help out. I'm just just out of curiosity, I you know, more than happy to assist if if they needed it. Um, I don't have any certainly complaints about that scenario. Uh, I didn't know if, if there'd been a issue like that that came about. Nothing that nothing that I can recall in the in the recent future for sure. The recent past rather. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking my questions and uh, that's all I got, Mike. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Bill. Yeah, so um, thank you again for coming and I I coincidentally had a phone call this afternoon from a, a resident who was a little concerned about, in his perception, a lack of visibility. So to kind of follow up on his angle a little bit, uh, not looking for hard and fast statistics, but uh, when you do write traffic tickets, um, percentage of time that you're writing tickets that are on Waterbury's ordinance on um, town highways versus Route 100 or Route 2 or anything like that. Do you do you write tickets? Do you do speed patrol in uh, on on town highways around the town? Something for you guys. Yeah. So I mean, my I tend to uh, be in high vis locations. Like you'll see me backed into the fire station in the front parking lot, um, looking for texting. Um, and with us for writing tickets versus warnings, uh, that's that's our discretion, right? Yeah. So it's not it's not a oh this is that that's certainly a ticket. Um, so it's case by case basis fully. Um, you know, there's not many spots uh, other than you know this main strip for speed patrols, um, but you'll see me daytime parked there, across from Cold Hollow. Try to try to stay in more high visibility spots uh, and kind of the entrances of of the town. Do you ever do uh, like Guptill Road or Neyland Flats? Those, those yeah. So I'll be uh, yes. I, I make multiple trips throughout uh, the back roads, probably three or four per day um, of all of the you know, Perry Hill, Guptill, Neyland Flats, Greg Hill. So you'll see me cruising around through there. Um, yeah, probably three or four times a day. We have a, uh, the select board got an email today from somebody, I don't know if he has his own radar gun, but yeah. he, he was, uh, was uh, running radar evidently on Loomis Hill Road. So yeah. if you want to talk about that, so. First, I, just, I have a couple of comments and then I'll have questions. One, I think our relationship is probably one of the best things we're seeing in policing. Uh, I think this is a real model of what we're doing with, with the contract with you because a lot of small communities are wrestling with the cost of maintaining their own police departments well, Why we're here now. And I think it, it works well to get, you know, we may not get maybe as good of a service because, you know, if you have your own police force, but can small communities afford to have all the training, the equipment and whatnot, it becomes a real burden on the taxpayer. So I think this is a model that a lot of communities may want to look at. And I don't know if maybe that could help, you know, the governor, you know, get you some more positions. You know, I know you look at Burlington, they're having problems with, you know, recruiting, you know, anecdotally, I would think Burlington would probably be one of the higher paid police departments in the state and when they're having problems getting I assume you're having problems with rec recruiting, you know, you know, troopers. It's, it's it's a real tough time in policing, and you guys do a great job, and it's it's tough. 
uh, going into a, a couple of questions, I think speeding is kind of, and it's, it's interesting because just the last couple of days, I just, I, 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 it's probably just co coincidence. I've seen a couple of stops in, in different areas in the, in the community where, you know, over the course of COVID, you know, and I understand why stops aren't going to be made because, you know, there's a whole bunch of, in, you know, if someone's going down the, down Route 100 at 90 miles an hour, that's probably one thing. If they're going, you know, 10 miles and over, you know, with the COVID issues, I'm prob it's probably not as much of a priority. But we're seeing, I think Bill kind of raised a couple of issues, Guptill Road, Neyland Flats, uh, We've had a lot of complaints on Little River Road going up to the um, reservoir, people speeding and, and, and complaining. And I know you can't be everywhere, but how do you think we could, uh, you know, I know you're not gonna be everywhere. What do you think would be good ways to approach some of these troublesome spots other than, you know, maybe putting, you know, the blinking lights and stuff like that? I'll take a time since you spoke last Go time. for it. Um, so the town already has several things that it employs for to notify uh, operators that they're speeding. There's the flashing lights that are currently right. in both directions on Star Road. Um, I know within the last month, Maple Street became a real issue, especially with increased uh, tourist traffic on Waterbury Stowe Road. Um, but the the speedometer that or not speed car the speed car uh, could be moved out there, or even one of the signs that's on Stowe Street moved out in that direction just letting operators know. Um, I'm the night shift trooper, and I often spend the first couple hours making sure that everyone in town gets to see the colors on the cruiser. Mm -hmm. So I try to hit almost every through it that's in town, everywhere that connects. Um, and that means usually around dinner time when uh, folks are downtown, I'm usually going back and forth, up and down Route 2, the back side of the neighborhoods, up Stowe Street, stuff like that. Everyone sees those blue flashing lights and that just automatically so The town wants me to put them on when I go through them. <laughs> <laughs> so I think part of it too is that, particularly that email from that was referenced, was like the early morning. So it's times when you're not here. So that's just part of it. You know, people are going to work. It's still dark because it's dark all the time this time of year. Um, so that's what we had talked about, you know, like the flashing light sign being, you know, a tool that we have to use because it's just, if you're not here, well, you know, it's not on, you can't be there. But that, it kind of leads to my question as I was looking at the numbers of calls for service, you know, when you're, when the troopers are not on duty versus on duty. And it looks, and I'm, I'm only looking at two months, so I'm not sure like the year of data, but it looks like it's pretty evenly spread and, and could wait either way sometimes. And I'm curious what, what was looked at in terms of those hours and if it feels like it's working really well or if it seems like maybe there's room to move. And I wasn't a part of the board when things were first, when the contract was first done and all the hours, so I'm curious if it's been talked about or thought about if maybe there's different hours during if well, possible. So I, Lieutenant White and I were both here when the first contract was negotiated. And um, when we were talking with uh, the folks from the state police, um, the colonel and, and other people who were assigned to come up with the first contract, we were told that you know we would have to work within the parameters of the state police and, and their normal work schedule. So they have a they have an agreement with the state and the troopers work certain shifts. And those are pretty typically the shifts that are available. Uh, we chose to, you know, basically the troopers are assigned 40 hours a week. Um, standard, there's, there's overtime, but we have two troopers for 40 hours a week each. It's 80 hours. And we essentially chose to leave Sunday as the day that we didn't really have coverage at all because day times Monday through Friday were the times that people are going to work, uh, we have school in session, and then having a trooper on Friday night and Saturday night seemed to be a good idea given the activity in the downtown. 
I believe the contract does have a provision that says that if it can be worked out on their end, uh, and we don't get to dictate anything, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is some ability that, you know, Lieutenant White could assign somebody, well, we want you to work this week on Tuesday and Wednesday, come in at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. Now, if they did that in the morning, um, there's probably some ramifications in terms of overtime and everything else, and that might trickle down to us. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. We've never pressed that provision. We've never really asked. Um, only really one time during the whole contract to this date have we ever really reached out with a specific concern, and Lieutenant White and I worked pretty um, uh, we had the issue with vagrants, if you will, camping uh, up behind uh, the old off-ramp on the interstate and up behind some of the houses on Stowe Street. And I don't know if troopers went out at odd times to deal with, with those kind of issues. But that was really the only time that we had any real kind of particular burr under the saddle issue that we were getting a lot of complaints about from the public. I mean. Every now and then, we got this one from Tom Scribner today about you know the speeding on Lummis Hill Road. Um, I did ask Bill Woodruff to get the uh, radar feedback sign up there. Even though we've already kind of taken him in for the winter, I asked him to put it back out for a while. Um, um, but you know, and I got the phone call this afternoon, which was about uh, patrolling in the neighborhoods and. The particular person said, you know, uh, on Route 100 at Guptill Road, a lot of times in non-high traffic hours, people are taking left-hand turns on the red light there because they don't feel like waiting. And I said, well, you know, unless you're right there, I mean, if, and if there's a trooper parked in the pullout on Route 100, people aren't going to do that. So you're only going to be able to catch that if you happen to be driving up the road when somebody does it. Anyway, so I don't know if you have a comment about the off hours. Uh, just, I mean, okay. mainly for the for the off hours, um, it, it wouldn't be something where I would just ask Ryan to sign on early because then it becomes a safety thing. Because literally, if if our, we have a day shift, the day shift guy comes out on at like five so that he can address issues that he sees at you know at six a.m. or something like that, he would literally be out by itself. We are the largest part-time police agency, probably in the country, um, because we don't have uh, the, the staffing, we don't have the, the bodies to, to have a 24-hour um, response. So our, our night shift goes off duty at 2 a.m. and they're on call until 4.30 and then our day shift comes on call at 4.30 until they sign on their shift at 8 o'clock. So um, if there was some specific um, data that we had, like if you had the, the, the sign up there that said, you know, on a regular basis at 6.15 in the morning, there's, you know, vehicles traveling in well in excess of the speed, then I could certainly, if we had that data to back it up, I would certainly say, hey, can someone come out with, with Ryan early? And I would feed him some overtime to, to come out so that we could have a couple of guys out. And it's just for, it's just a safety thing for us because literally if, if he's out by himself and gets into something at 6 a.m., you know, the, that next trooper on call could literally be, they could, you know, the, he could live in Randolph mm -hmm. and have to come all the way up here. Um, and then just to speak to kind of the days of the week, um, when there's things uh, going on in town on a Saturday, and I, I can think back specifically back to the car show, mm -hmm. um, I asked Ryan to, to kind of shift his schedule a little bit, so he was in town uh, during that weekend so that we had presence during the day when normally we wouldn't. Um, and I've asked these guys to, to do some things like that. We have the Fourth of July. Fourth of July, July the Independence Day. You're yeah, probably in line for the the parade. parade. Yeah, the River of Light Parade. These guys are, are both kind of um, are going to come in for for that on a, on off days or on off time. So um, if if we know that there's something going on and uh, you know we can we can shift it far enough in advance to. To make that happen, we, we do that just to make sure that there is a presence when there should be one. Maybe you could help us. I know this is kind of probably outside of the contract, and maybe 
you know, it's something that's becoming more of a problem than Waterbury, and maybe you could have some creative ideas for us. In our downtown, we have parking problems, and we're seeing that. I, you know, I think you have a lot more important things to, than giving a lot of parking tickets and stuff like that. Anything that you could recommend to us to do that might help with the parking situation? <clears throat> what, I guess, what, what specifically what is, the, is the issue that you're referring to? Well, we have, it's just, in, in, the, in the downtown, you know, what we used to have by the bank parking lot is now a paid, but no one, no one wants that go to paid parking. And people are going farther and farther away, and you're seeing people parking in illegal spots and, and stuff, and, you know, some of them are, are supposed to be temporary spaces, but they're being used for maybe longer term parking. I don't know what, you know, I'm, we're just looking for some help. Well, I've already told you on the parking <laughs> stuff. Right. If it's that kind of stuff, you know, you can. You don't need to be a sworn officer to issue a parking ticket. Um, the the so we could hire somebody, you know, right. twenty hours a week to go around and and write parking tickets for downtown parking enforcement. We have had some complaints of late um, from uh, Gary Dillon, the fire chief, who's just concerned about trying to get emergency vehicles around the school at school, in particular, pickup time in the afternoon. Drop off time, people come, they drop their kid and they drive away. But in the afternoon, they're, you know, they're queuing up on Stowe Street, on High Street, and uh, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And we haven't talked yet with the school principal about that. I emailed them. You did, okay, great. Yeah, I think something, something outside of an enforcement officer or something out, if there was some creative way to maybe help that whole part. Yeah, I was, I was gonna echo what, what Bill said, you, you know, to issue a municipal parking ticket, you don't have to be a sworn right. officer. And then the, the thing around the schools with emergency vehicles, I think it comes down to just taking the time to do some education <coughs> and getting people to understand, to, you know, what, ha what happens if something goes on right now yeah. um, and you're just sitting in the middle of the, the freeway or, or however, and maybe it just takes, a, you know, someone to kind of point out those things. Okay, and the, just the last thing, you know, being part of the Central Vermont uh, State Police Advisory Board, I really, I think there, our attendance has been waning and stuff like that, and I think the group, the people still involved can be really helpful, because I think that the dialogue like we're having here is really important, you know, and I think that group is a lot of people who you know, believe in the importance of law enforcement. I think, you know, that group has not met with, you know, the state police a lot. And I think just in terms of the whole central Vermont area, I think if you, the more we have dialogue about things, the more effective policing that we, that we could have. And I think it's really, really important, you know, especially in these times, crazy times where you get attacked with so, so many things that, you know, and. I don't expect you to be guys to be social workers, but sometimes you wind up being social workers for a lot of, a lot of things. But you do what you can, and you, you know you're doing a really, you know, no, noble job. It's really a noble thing to be in law enforcement. But you know, I think that this communication is great, and I think you know working with the whole Central Vermont Advisory Board, I think would be really helpful. I know your times are really stretched with COVID and stuff like that. Yeah, and I, I just met with uh, with the President, Jeff, um, yeah. last week, and that's kind of why we postponed the, the meeting that we're supposed right. to have uh, tomorrow night so that we can try and engage the other towns within within our, our board that don't, don't have the representation and try and uh, kind of get, get some of that back. So um, the hope is that we can get through the holidays, um, get some get some more interest through the towns, and mm -hmm. and get the get those folks that are are represented in their town to kind of help us kind of forward that message to the other towns to to kind of get that representation. Because yeah, like I said, the the communication yeah. is is huge, and especially um, you know it'll be it'll be good to get back to that. Thanks, Lieutenant. I really appreciate that. Mr. Bard, can I make a comment? Sure. I just, I live on South Main Street, and you've heard complaints about people. Can you go up so that other people can hear from the camera? Sorry. Um, I live on South Main Street, and you've 
heard some complaints tonight about you not being visible, but I just want to say thank you because before we had the contract with you, we had a village police department and our houses were getting broken into and South Main Street was a drag strip. And that hasn't happened even since the pave, you know, the paving we've been done down there for a year. So I think your presence has been a good one. I feel like I can leave my door unlocked at times again now, which I hadn't for several years. And the noise is <laughs> the noise. No, I won't. I won't. But I won't. It's really great. <laughs> but I just, you know, I don't think you hear enough compliments. But whether it's your visibility or people know the troopers are now in town or whatever, from my perspective, I have, I have at least the same, if not better, coverage than when we had our own village police force. So. Well, thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I think I'm from the rec department too. The <laughs> Nick, you <laughs> Nick, 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 Nick. From the rec department, I mean, I have no issues. I, I came in right when the contract started, and we've transferred through a bunch of officers, and uh, nothing but positive things. I text Ryan all the time. He's got really clever spots through Waterbury Center and here. If, if I wasn't working for the town and I was going a little fast, I would. Definitely would be. I would definitely get ticketed because he, he's got some really good spots. Uh, but the super fair response time to the park stuff, like River of Light and all the parade stuff, any community events, they're super, super on it. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any other comments? If not, I thank you for coming, and we want to keep the dialogue open. I think this was great that we had this. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Take care. Be well. Keep up the good work. Thank you, gentlemen. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Good work. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item. Consideration and possible repeal of the Town of Waterbury ordinance regarding Act 250 review designation. Bill? Steve. Yes. Steve. I'm here. Okay. So uh, we've had a number of discussions. I will take my mask, of course, so people can hear better. So we've had a number of discussions about this issue. Uh, just a quick recap. Uh, we've had the, the Town of Waterbury Ordinance regarding Act 250 review designation since 2013. The select board at the time felt that we needed to stay as a, a one-acre town for commercial projects for the threshold. Uh, we were previously a one-acre town. We enacted subdivision bylaws in 2012, which normally would have the town go to a 10-acre threshold. So the select board at the time opted to stay at the one-acre um, threshold uh, just to have that added layer of review. Uh, we uh, had the establishment of the Development Review Board uh, the year before that. So they were fairly uh, new to the review process. Um, the Planning Commission has discussed this um, at some length, um, and we don't have any Planning Commission members here tonight. Steve Parcher came to your last meeting, and I thought he gave a really good recap. I, I don't feel a need to recap that. I think all of you were present at that meeting. So, uh, you know, there definitely are concerns, uh, and um, so I just as soon keep it short and sweet. Um, I uh, got in touch with our municipal attorney, uh, David Rue, and uh, we, Bill and I reported uh, the last meeting uh, David's advice. Uh, you can repeal an ordinance by putting it on the agenda. And as a repeal, um, if you take action, uh, with, the, with the repeal, with the motion to repeal the ordinance, then uh, we have to post um, a notice in five places and put it in the newspaper within 14 days. And um, then uh, there's no public hearing required, but there is the option uh, within 60 days uh, for a petition. If uh, citizens feel strongly, they can um, do a petition for a vote, a town vote, and that would be regarding, again, regarding the appeal, so that potentially the town voters could overturn your action. That's really the only uh, appeal, if you will, of this select board it's action. 45 days. Uh, it's actually, <clears throat> it is 60 days for... Um, I thought it takes effect in 60 days. Okay, let me, you may be right, Bill. Yeah, so you have to put it in 14 days. Um, 
So unless the petition is filed in accordance with section 1973 of this title, it's a state statute, the ordinance shall become effective 60 days after the date of its adoption right. or at such time following the expiration. So they, the, the specific statute that allows a petition. So once yep. we post it, yep. they have 45 days to submit a petition. Okay. If they don't submit okay, the petition in the 45 other. days, okay. then it okay. becomes effective in 60 days. Okay. Are you signature, Steve? Um, I did grant, I think it's 5% of the voter check <laughs> similar to other. How many is that, Carl? <laughs> about <laughs> 230 something. Two, about 220. Yeah. Ish. Again, Carl? About 220. Thank you. So that's really all I had to say, unless you have questions on more of the legal side of it. So, Bill, we're in the process now. We, you know, we have basically started that process. So, unless we have an appeal letter. So, you haven't repealed anything yet. Yeah. Right. We it's on the agenda tonight. If you want to make a motion to repeal that ordinance, right. I think you have language that yes. you could do that. And then what happens once you make that motion, then as soon as practicable tomorrow, we'll, we'll post the fact that you repealed the ordinance and we'll post with it instructions that says the voters have 45 days to submit a petition to ask for a town meeting to overturn their decision. If no petition comes in, then 60 days after the vote, on the 61st day, the repeal is effective. Okay. If a petition comes in within that 45 days or 44 days, whatever it is, then that comes to the select board and then the select board would have to warn a town meeting to see if the voters would appeal that would repeat, would overturn your decision. So that's what the process is. What's the time frame on the town meeting? 30 days. Within I mean, 30 days? Well, a 30 day notice. They'd have to warn, they, they probably have, you know, within a certain prescribed time, but they would have to have a warning that 30 days in advance. Before that motion is made, is there going to be discussion tonight about it? It's up to the board. It's the yeah. board's. The board's uh, meeting. So, well, maybe because I heard at the last meeting we we heard very compelling um, evidence for a possible, you know, change to go to you know go to a, you know from the one acre to to the ten acres because right. it wouldn't affect too many proposals. Uh, I don't. I, I, at least I can speak for myself. I didn't see too many slippery slopes. Maybe if you could expound, Steve, on the reluctance of the planning commission. Sure. So our review process for commercial projects is limited to site plan review and uh, conditional use if a project requires conditional use review. So in certain areas like um, impact to historic sites and historic districts, uh, broader traffic impacts, uh, some impacts to natural resources, uh, wetlands, things of that nature, um, our criteria are quite limited in scope. So the Act 250 criteria are much broader and more detailed and the Act 250 process is essentially a referral process to state agencies. So if there are wildlife impacts, the Agency of Natural Resources gets involved. If there are transportation impacts, uh, the Vermont Agency of Transportation gets involved. So if there are historic district, if there are involvement there, the Division for Historic Preservation makes comment. So the criteria are more detailed, the referral process is more detailed. So um, projects that might, we have, uh, actually six historic districts, so we often have um, projects that do have some impact there. So there are some situations where uh, with these um, types of projects that there is more, it's a more robust review through Act 250. 
The flip side of that is that there's a cost involved, there are significant fees, there's uh, consultant costs, sometimes there are traffic in, or uh, transportation impact fees, like Paris Gunshop uh, Bill recounted that experience, which um, was a bit of an ordeal. So, so there, there is an economic development aspect to this that it, it's an added cost, you know, especially for smaller projects that might only be on an acre and a half site. And uh, Duncan and his engineer, John Petrosky, gave you some uh, testimony about that. So I think that that's kind of the spectrum of concerns. The Planning Commission is working on the Unified Development Bylaw. Ultimately, we'll get to site plan review, conditional use review. The current draft has some additional criteria. Uh, the Planning Commission proposed historic district review in our other historic districts. That was met with a lot of opposition. Uh, so we didn't move forward with that. But there are other ways that we can address some of these concerns. Some of them uh, may or may not. You, you may decide. Um, or you will decide whether to move forward with those ultimately. So, so there, there are some gaps that we can fill locally, but the reality is that a local review is not as uh, extensive and we don't refer things out to the state agencies. We don't have local Act 250 review. Such a thing exists, but it's a very high bar. We have a lot of uh, extra standards we have to meet. So we, but that again, really just affects projects that are under Act 250 jurisdiction. Yeah. So is this a chicken and the egg kind of situation where I think you just suggested that uh, the unified development bylaws, they're considering additional criteria mm -hmm. for site plan review. Mm -hmm. You mentioned historic stuff and there's been opposition. So my question was whether before or after the select board makes this decision, the planning commission through the town plan process and the bylaw process has the ability to expand the criterion by which they will uh, review site plans, right? Correct. Yes. So they, they could address some of these things, but it will take time. Yep. And if the, if the bylaw is repealed now, then we just go forward with what we have for the existing site plan criterion, right? Correct. Yeah, that's correct. And, and then the, the planning commission could propose more robust criteria later. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so it is, as I thought, and as Steve indicated, that um, you know, it's it's more robust right now through Act 250, and if you do it right now, our our review process will not be as robust as that, and it probably will never be as robust as Act 250, right. even if. The planning commission added some things. They probably would not, uh, you know, carbon copy the ten criterion plus Act Two Fifty. Yeah. Right. As sure as a corner of my eye Yeah, I mean, like Could some of the new percent. Sorry, right. John Grace. Yeah, John Grace. Some of the permits that you were mentioning uh, were already required to get, even without the Act Two Fifty review, like an ANR permit or a construction general permit. And really, Act 250 is just a summary of all the permits that you're required to get through um, all the various state agencies. And I think I'm right on that. Um, so I, I guess my, my point is the, the, the cost of going through Act 250, just to go through a summary of all your permits that you're already required to get, I'm not sure there's a real benefit for a smaller project. As you get higher up, it might be able to create uh, conditions for you to have to follow, but um, I guess I'm kind of following on the side of our DRB current um, regulations might be okay because once you submit an application to the state, they actually go through the process and let you know what other permits you might actually need to get. And then Act 250 is just a summary of that. And is that correct, Steve? Um, I, yeah, John, I wouldn't necessarily agree. Um, okay. I think that certainly what your point is good that um, any projects, regardless of size, that meet certain thresholds have to get stormwater permits, wetland permits, other state permits. So you're absolutely correct there. But I wouldn't agree that Act 250 is a summary. I think there are other criteria that, that 
get into other areas, whether it's uh, historic issues or you know, something change. beyond. But certainly a curb cut on Route 100 is going to have to be um, dealt with regardless of the size of the parcel. So you're absolutely right. Uh, but so maybe be Act 250 nice is a more robust sort of expansive. It's an environmental protection law, to be honest with you. It's really, uh, and it's expanded into historic preservation. Yeah, they talk about you know, air pollution, they talk yeah. about traffic, uh, they talk about aesthetics in yep. some instances and the like. So it, it is a, it's, it's more than what you said, John. Yeah. Uh, but just so everyone is clear, what John said is true. Even if you repeal this ordinance and um, projects from between one and 10 acres no longer have to go through Act 250, it does not mean that they don't need to get state permits mm -hmm. if they are permitted. So, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah, good. Thanks, yeah. so much. <laughs> I'm going to try not to cry because this is very difficult because I'm on the opposite side of John and I apologize. He's my son and he's buying the property we own. But I had the, and I've been vaccinated and boosted, so um, we are all good. I have seen how DRBs work and Act 250 work because I live and put and was involved in a suit with the dirt pile incident on South Main Street. So I wrote something for each of you, and I'll, tr I'll try to read it today because I know those guys. You might want to make sure they. Yeah, you guys are have to read. I don't know everybody. I know. I'm Danny. Hi, Danny. Um, Thanks. 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 And I do feel bad because we're just a little over an acre, but I just have been burnt badly. So, um, so over the past decade, I've learned a lot about Act 250 and the local zoning process, including DRB appeals. I've learned the strengths and weaknesses <coughs> of a citizen board, as well as the need of a, for a system of checks and balances that's underwritten by strong local zoning regulations. It's my understanding that you may be voting tonight to repeal Waterbury's current status as a one-acre town for the purpose of Act 250 consideration. Since I only recently heard of this myself, I'm curious and concerned as to how informed the general public is of this proposal. In addition, how involved has the Planning Commission been in the proposed change? They spent the last, past couple of years or more, and I've been at a lot of those meetings, updating the local zoning ordinances and probably a valuable insight into whether or not the Act 250 criterion will be adequately covered in the revised bylaws. I'm hopeful you'll reach out to all the stakeholders in the process versus just those close to the developmental process, development process. I'm hopeful you'll consider my following ideas and your deliberations tonight and postpone the vote to a future date when all stakeholders have been consulted. Number one, the local DRB is often made up of engineers, architects, and builders who potentially have biased opinions in favors of the developers they do business with in our small town. Some members, which was the case in my case, have pre-existing working relationships with local developers, which can make objectivity difficult. This is in dark contrast to my personal experience with the Act 250 board members who come from various corners of the district and not from our town. In the past, I've been told the town of Waterbury does not have a large enough planning budget to handle permit enforcement for its existing zoning laws to say anything about adequately overseeing the additional criteria currently being used under Act 250. Our current zoning laws do not yet have ordinances that pertain specifically to historic preservation in the entire historic district versus just our historic downtown. However, Criterion 8 in the Act 250 process covers aesthetics, scenic and natural beauty, and the preservation of historic sites. One of the reasons we were successful in getting the dirt pile out from behind our house was because of the historic preservation um, criterion as well as the fact that there had been no stormwater changes made uh, or stormwater permits gotten on that piece of property. Um, so, excuse me, criterion, so the unique homes of North and South Main Street have history and architecture dating back to the early 1800s, including Waterbury's first home, which sits on probably an acre or less down on uh, Butler, by Butler Pond, is the um, Lemery House, which was the first, I can't remember the 
what was the man's name? Ezra Butler. Ezra Butler's home. Um, it's imperative that we continue to maintain the historical integrity of these properties versus allowing them to be burned down by the local fire department to wait, make way for more modern structures, which was the case for a beautiful house on South Main Street not but two years ago. I have found my past DRB experience to be incredibly flawed pertaining to the checks and balances needed to ensure that developers get the appropriate state permits before beginning construction. This includes consultation with floodplain and stormwater experts as outlined in criteria three and four of Act 250. Given my home's proximity to the floodplain on South Main Street and a shared ditch that said sheds stormwater from 170 plus acres, including Interstate 89, I have concerns that flood and stormwater reviews will be minimized or even checked at all, which has been my past experience with the DRB. I had to bring the checklist issue up at a DRB hearing when they were going to give the permit. They, there was no requirement at that time to meet, to get any of those state permits. And I don't know if there is now. <laughs> Uh, lastly, I fear the expense of appealing any infringements by the de developer will fall on private citizens versus the developer, who often has many lawyers and professionals at their disposal. We spent upwards of $125,000 of our own money um, trying to get the dirt pile removed from the floodplain behind our house before we connected with the Act 250 Commission, who ultimately required it to be removed. I realize they're an expense to the developer for using the Act 250 process, but I believe that expense will be fairly trans unfairly transferred to bordering landowners if we change to a 10-acre 10-acre town, and they'll be the ones spending the thousands of dollars to fund the experts instead of the developers. Within Vermont, we have approximately 128 one-acre towns and 134 10-acre towns. Several 10-acre towns are considered such because they've not yet adopted permanent zoning and subdivision regulations, so they automatically fall under 10-acre townships. However, others such as Waterbury have elected to remain one-acre towns until their zoning ordinances are further updated, which I wholeheartedly agree with. I cannot support becoming a 10-acre town until there's supporting evidence that the Act 250 criterion are, that I spoke of are adequately covered in Waterbury's local zoning ordinances and the Planning Commission has an active role in that process. To do otherwise is to put the community, its taxpayers, and our government at risk for further litigation, as well as appearing overly biased toward development. I'm hopeful you consider my request to table the repeal at this time and wait until our current zoning laws can provide equal protection to both private landowners and developers. Thank you. Kathy, can you say, can you say that? I have a question for you. Okay. I have a dumb question for you. So if you own this property and you want us to wait on this, why do you just not say no to the project? Because I think the project is a good project. Okay. And I think, I think that, I don't think that they will have the problems getting that permit that the ambulance who also had interest in that getting it because it's not going to be as discerning to the neighbors. This was very difficult for me. I mean, I, maybe we need two acres or 1.5 acres. I mean, I feel really badly about this, but I just can't I go through it again yeah. because the field behind my house is two acres. Mm -hmm. So if you go to one acre or 10 acres, mm -hmm. that, that could be exact. No, I know you're gonna say that Mr. Lamberton owns more than 10 acres, but people can sell an acre to somebody or two acres to somebody for a temporary time not have to go through Act 250 and then buy back him. And I'm not saying he will do that, but I just, I really feel like the local process failed us and I don't want it to happen again. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. One, I do want to address some of the issues that you, you did bring up in this discussion. I know, I served with your son on the, on the DRB, and I don't know if things have changed in the last three years on the, on the DRB. But I think, unlike with your portrayal here, I think it's a very dedicated group of individuals who are not just, I, I'm not an architect, I, I wasn't a developer, I was involved in affordable housing, I was involved in farming, 
I had a very broad, and I, I hope they recruit a broad brush group of individuals. I know they're very professional individuals. I think, at least from my opinion, they're trying to do the best for Waterbury. And I think some of what they could request in similar track 50 reviews, they could request from a better developer do historic preservation, do environmental reviews, do all kind of traffic studies. They can, but it's not required. That's what I was told. Right. I was told that there's no policy that requires those permits from the state and that they as a board agreed that they wouldn't require that. It's only as good as the rules, Mark. You weren't on that right. board. I, 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 know, I know we did for some of the bridge lines that we, we required to do some seen in assessments of, of things before project were, were approved. I don't know if things have changed on, on the DRB, but they can do a lot of the things I just said. And well, this you know, was a jerk you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry what happened with your, with your situation. I think that's very, very unfortunate. But I sometimes don't, I don't think Act 250 is necessarily the solution to everything in, in, in our state. It, it was developed. And I know from being, you know, I was in environmental education and agricultural education as a student. I studied under Darby Bradley, who was one of the architects for Act 250. Act 250 has, you know, the, the change was it was to prevent large scale developments from you know, that are going to impact our community. And that's one of the things, I, I don't necessarily I think, I think there are really a handful of projects that will potentially affect that. And if we have an active DRB who will ask for historic studies, which we can, we can work with the State Historic Preservation Office. If we want to do environmental reviews, we can ask for that. And I just, I, I just think to, and Do you I don't have think I'm being biased. I, I, I think it's just another level of bureaucracy that we're that we're asking to do. And I think our DRB, if they if they don't do the job that they're supposed to do, they can do it. But they need, a there needs to be requirements, and b just so you know, 96 percent of projects that go through Act 250, I looked on the state website today, are approved. 96 percent. Yeah. So and how much time and how much cost? It, it's, it's cost. It, ultimately, this state is because I'm very, I work with people from all over the country. Our development costs in this state are huge. That's why a, a lot of people from other states don't want to work here because, I, and I'm not saying I think some of the standards to keep our environment, to keep our historic preservations are really important, but are we going to sacrifice a lot of our economic vitality to protect a few projects? I just want to say I don't, I want to make sure that you feel like you were heard and I appreciate your letter and I'm, it's terrible when things don't go right and you're the one in that position and I don't want you to feel like as we move forward with the discussion and the vote that it's because we don't hear what you're saying. Um, and, and, and this is valuable. And also to address what you talked about with stakeholders, um, this is I think the third meeting at which we've discussed at length. Planning Commission members have, be, have been here, have listened to the meetings, have given input, so it's not without communication. So I just want to address that to make sure that that's clear. And also it's, again, it's the third public meeting it was on the agenda, not as an appeal or a repeal last time, um, but it was on the agenda. All of those meetings can be reviewed also via Zoom, so if you want to see, or the um, recordings, so if you want to see the conversations and the input that we got from other folks, um, that's a way that you can also yourself here and uh, also send it to others. My understanding was the planning commission was split on it. Is that accurate? So they didn't give us an input as a board, only certain individuals gave input. So it wasn't like a vote or anything like that where there were numbers, you know. And um, my, I just want to clarify something. Sure. I know a lot of the DRB members now and I do think they're fine, but there's no guarantee that that will always be the case. 
Unless, and you say, we wanted or we asked for. But it, it, we're with Act 250, it's required. It's run, not wanted or asked for. Run for a seat on the DRP. We need a variety of people with different skills. You don't have to be a professional architect and whatnot. You just have to have some good common sense. It's good to have engineers, architects on on that on the DRB, but I think sometimes when people come with that common sense perspective, I think that's important. I just thank you. Mike? Yes, uh, could could you, Chris, could Duncan speak first yeah. and I'll go to you. Okay, sure. Go ahead. So I'm Duncan McDougall, and I've spoken about this project before. Um, the background is that the Children's Literacy Foundation, a nonprofit that's been run in Waterbury for 23 year, 24 years now, is hoping to purchase a 1.3 acre property uh, on Route 100, and hoping to build a one-story, uh, 3,300 square foot building. And uh, first of all, I respect and thank you, Mrs. Grace, for sharing your heartfelt feelings. Um, and I would just note that Mrs. Grace's situation and Cliff's situation are not, neither of them are common. I think for the most part our situation, a local nonprofit that has a one-story building that has very little traffic, that's probably not totally representative of the projects you may get. And unfortunately Mrs. Grace's situation with the dirt pile, that's probably not common either. And I think what the select board should think about is what kind of support do you have from the DRB and from the Planning Commission. As you've heard before, of all the towns in Vermont um, that have um, uh, subdivision regulations, there are only three that are still one acre town, and they seem to be doing just fine. And our DRB and our Planning Commission are really quite strong. And we have, for example, on the DRB, we have the historical preservation expert. And we have other folks who have a lot of deep background and as Steve said at the last meeting, if there are any issues that come up with regard to wildlife preservation or pre, uh, pre, you know, historic preservation, those are things that the town can turn to the state experts and get their advice and support for. Um, I do not disagree that Act 250 is a much more robust process and that those folks in that process perhaps have more expertise and more experience in this. There's no doubt about that. But I think the question is, is that level of um, rigor and review necessary for a smaller project that's under 10 acres? And I appreciate Mrs. Grace saying that you know, in Act 250, 96% of the projects are approved. And I think that's an important point to remember, that projects like ours are gonna have to go through the whole process, the time-consuming process, the money, the experts, and everything else, and there's a 96% chance it's going to get approved. And most of what's going to be covered, most of the permits that we need, we're going to have to do anyways because the state requires it. We're already starting to file all those permits. So it's almost like we have to go through this whole process twice in a much more expensive way. And for a smaller project, it's probably not going to have that kind of level of impact. And if it did, your town with the DRB and the Planning Commission have the ability to deal with that. So, um, as I said at the last meeting, if you were a developer and you had a small project and you had a couple of towns that you were considering, you really might think twice about coming to Waterbury if you're under 10 acres because you have to go through this whole process that involves risk and time and money. And in another town, you might be able to just get local permits and go ahead. So it is a development issue for the town. And it certainly is an issue for our local nonprofit. Uh, and I do understand that Act 250 would bring more expertise and all that, but the question I think you all need to decide is, is that really necessary for the kind of projects in general you're going to see? There are going to be some outliers on both sides, but overall, does that make sense? And someone earlier on said the Planning Commission was not in support of this, but at the last meeting there was a representative from the Planning Commission who said the board was indeed split. He was, in fact, in, in favor of making the change. Some other members were in favor as well. So we've heard different views, but I, I think really that's the, the balance you have to strike is, yes, Act 250 would bring more rigor, more expertise, but also for those folks who are trying to bring development and opportunities to our town, 
they have to go through a lot of hurdles that may make them think twice about coming to Waterbury. So what makes sense in the balance? It's not black or white, it's not this is perfect and this is not. There are trade-offs on both sides, which I understand, but I, in my view, the trade-offs seem to indicate that it's probably worth making a change. Most other towns in Vermont in this situation made the change a long time ago, and there hasn't been a big uproar in that. Um, the zoning bylaws uh, are being changed right now, and as you heard, they can be strengthened to fill certain gaps, and you have the ability to, to turn to other outside experts if there are certain gaps you really feel you need to have covered. So. Thank you for listening. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Mrs. Springs, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I first want to say I I recognize and appreciate Kathy's concerns as well as Duncan's. Um, a couple questions for Steve. Um, has there been any conservation groups that have come to the table expressing any concerns about these possible this possible repeal? That's number one question. Number two question is, do we have to go from one to 10 acres? Is, or is there an in-between number that you could hit um, that might satisfy some of these smaller projects such as Duncan's uh, and how does addressing uh, some of these Act 250 concerns or concerns that Kathy brought to the table as well, uh, we repeal this tonight, does that just mean that we automatically stamp somebody else's project that comes through that's such as, as Duncan's or is there a time frame in which Planning Commission has a chance to address some of these issues and maybe incorporate them in the zoning regs that we have here to perhaps strengthen a little bit more of the criteria that we currently have uh, to address some of these other concerns. All right, well, let me try to answer your questions, Chris. <laughs> um, so um, the Conservation Commission, um, to my knowledge, is not weighed in. Billy Victor, who's a member of the Conservation Commission, is on the meeting this evening. And I think, do they get the select board agendas or does the chair? Uh, they may be on the list. I don't know. If they, um, if they subscribe, they would receive ours. Yeah. And um, they are on the distribution for the Planning Commission agendas. And, and it has been on the agenda a couple times for the Planning Commission to discuss. So uh, they're definitely, um, you know, in the loop as far as um, having an opportunity if they so choose to, to weigh in. So on the one to 10 acre um, move, Chris, uh, there, there, I should look at the camera, otherwise I'm staring at the screen, but um, so the, uh, there is no middle ground. Um, either we shift, we, the, the ordinance is repealed and we become a 10 acre town vis-a-vis -vis Act 250 for commercial projects for the threshold or we remain the one acre. So there's no, we don't have an option to pick two acres or five acres or some other um, number. So, so that's the answer to that question. And the, the time frame for the Planning Commission is up to them as far as enacting, or proposing rather, any regs. It's up to the select board, it's up to all of you to enact them. But um, so uh, they're not, it's not in the current draft to address the site plan or conditional use criteria. They're focused on um, the area between I-89 and um, the Winooski River, and they're not dealing with the review process right at this time. Uh, that will be that'll come down the road. I can't give you a time frame, but it's it would not be within uh, the 60 days if you decide to repeal this. It would not be within the 60 days um, that. Um, the time period before your uh, repeal would become effective, barring a, a petition within the 45 days that, that Bill talked about. So I think that's the answer, the best answer I can give to that question. Well, I just, I, I, I feel almost like to some degree that we're under pressure, just like we were with a, a lawsuit that was uh, put towards the town here just a little while ago for not meeting some other zoning requirements, um, not that we have a lawsuit pending on this one, but um, 
you know, I just, I don't want to have, I don't want to get stuck in another knee jerk reaction. Um, if there's, if there's any way of maybe bringing some middle ground to this process, um, uh, you know, maybe, a, a low impact versus a high impact criteria that would cover us if, if, uh, you know, in a case like Duncan's where I would perceive that as being a low impact um, and the criteria for that would be obviously less. And if we got into a high impact uh, development project that the criteria might get a little more strict um, if, if that's part of possible, you know, new regs to address this 10 acre repeal take place to address a 10 acre ruling you know 10 acre uh, uh scenario can i just add one quick thing to your to your question or your thought chris that this is sort of a, a quick thing that's just come up my understanding is that revitalizing waterbury has been advocating for this for some years and that the development what's her name the development uh, well, listen, listen, Dustin was the uh, economic development director. She's right. the chair of the planning something that she has been advocating for for some time while she was in her role. So this is not a brand new thing that has just popped up. It's something that has been considered for a while and has been advocated for for a while. Thanks. So you, as Alyssa, keep kept that that position. I think that's her personal view. She, as okay. chair of the planning commission, I think um, she spoke that there there are a range of, of right. views. I don't I think there always will be. Right. I, I don't think there's a. Uh, that's why we're America. The, we're yeah, America. yeah. I don't know. The middle ground would take a while, Chris. I think we're at least a year or two off before the planning commission is going to be and able to get to. I wonder as well as if we, you know, the number of projects we're not. The door is being banged down necessarily with project after project where I think like if the repeal happens, you know, in early 22, that it's not, I don't know that it will make a huge difference to wait six to 12 m months necessarily in that there'll be like a flood of things that cause problems. Um, like the time, you know, so that I don't see necessarily the, a huge benefit to waiting um, a significantly longer time, knowing that we can continue to work on the changing of bylaws. Um, yeah, I understand that. The first gentleman who spoke about affordable housing. Right. You know, if he wants to build thousands of affordable housing units on less than 10 acres, if you do this, that won't go through Act 250, right? right. But I have well, our DRB is going to be yeah, on top the, of that situation. Like that. Let me just answer the question. So, so the threshold for housing is different. Uh, that has changed. So it moved, I think, from six lots to ten lots. Triggers Act 250 and a multifamily housing. A so this only affects the uh, non-residential oh, projects, okay. right? Also, right. people keep saying that the DRB can this, the DRB can that. The DRB can only enforce what's written down. Right now, we don't have any historical pieces in our zoning laws. That's why that house got burned. That's why if somebody buys the oldest house in Waterbury, they could A, tear it down, they could burn it, they could put something up there that's not even related. And there's nothing in our DRB that uh, prevents that. But, I mean, but, we, but I think but the same spoke to that. Sure. But my... It's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Finish, Chad. Go ahead. When I got up, I heard Stark rolled into our house during the DRB, I was told, it didn't matter, we didn't have any regs in there. When I brought up the water thing, I said, it doesn't matter, that's not part of our regs. When I brought up the checklist of them having to go to get a water permit, to go to the floodplain coordinator in the state, to go to all the things that I was said they had to go to, I was told that that DRB board um, didn't have a policy on that. So the, our zoning laws are only as strong as what's written down. Otherwise, people can say, yes, I'll do that, or no, I won't do that. Right. And that's what's going to cause lawsuits. So my, uh, only with regard to this historic preservation stuff, and you might have alluded to this at the beginning of the meeting, I think we had 
a pretty good conversation, and most of the general public came out and said they didn't want historical preservation in it. Didn't that they? was historic district review for all of our districts. That yeah, I think it, the I time. was at that meeting at um, Bill. There was a lot of confusion. It wasn't that they didn't want to preserve the historic part. There was confusion about whether people were going to tell them what they could do with their windows. There were not answers to the questions being asked. Okay. But I, I just want to make that clear that you can't keep saying it's going to be up to the up to the DRB because it's up to what's written on that paper. Right. <laughs> but they could, if something's in a historic district, they could ask for a historic review. Well, let me just I address that, Mike. <laughs> so if, if it's conditional, if it's a conditional use right. review, there can be no undue adverse impact to historic sites right. or structures. So. So that's the criteria under conditional use. If it's just site plan review, then um, their their hands are kind of tied. Other than what what's proposed and what we can. What about the storm water? That's a state and issue. Hopefully, in the updated yeah. zoning process, that that's going to be looked at a little bit more. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll right. want to look at it again. Absolutely. Well, that's why I said though, why don't you wait until we get update the zoning laws? Because. You know, you say how many projects are out there. Well, once you change to a one-acre town, and some of those holes are there, you it's may correct. see a lot of them. Right. <laughs> Any further questions or comment? May I make a comment? Yes. Sure, I'd like to just respond a little bit to the conservation aspects of this. Um, Steve is right. We do get notice from planning commission agendas we do not get uh, sorry i'm a conservation commissioner we've not addressed this and i'm not speaking for them i'm speaking for me we do get planning commission steve is good about getting that to us um i personally didn't appreciate uh the act 250 question until i saw lisa scagliotti's article in the waterbury reader we have not addressed this um the commission has submitted comments though to the planning commission um basically um, for the new development bylaws really reflecting very significant weaknesses in protecting the environment and the existing development bylaws. And we were relying on those to see those changes. I've also participated personally in a number of development review board reviews and the treatment of conservation issues is, um, let's just say wanting significantly. When I believe issues have been raised at the commission, at the DRB, They've not even asked. So what I would ask is if, if you want the views of the commission, I would ask the select board to ask the views a little bit. I can take it back, obviously, and, and see, see what they say about this, number one. And number two, I would say from the environmental standpoint, you should not assume the DRB or the regulations will protect any of the environment, um, like on um, ridgeline, hillside, sleep slopes, conditional reviews, re, uh, review, the Callan project, for example, DRB was going to pass that until the Act 250 permitting process required the applicants to change some roads so they wouldn't destroy a riparian um, buffer or riparian area um, in the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor. And I'm not going to go through a list of other things, but Act 250 has played a good role, at least for larger projects. So I'll just stop there. Billy, can I ask a question? Um, so something I'm trying to, I'm Danny, by the way, hi. I'm trying to understand, because a lot of what had been said at previous meetings was that there wasn't a lot in that 1 to 10 range that would um, be a, a massive issue regularly, right? So like the projects that you're talking about sound larger scale. And so I'm trying to understand where, where those kinds of projects or how often or how many, ex like what, what types of land exist where that between the one and 10, these types of issues would arise. Was that question clear? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it was, and I wish I had the data. And one of the reasons I was not going to say anything is because I am just, I, Act 250 is foreign to me at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking of the developments, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the bigger developments that have been up on, uh, like the Worcester Range, have probably been over 10, right, Steve? So I don't know that there have been subdivisions up there or development in the last two to three years that were less than. So statistically, I'm not sure there would be a lot there. Maybe you're right. 
Um, but I don't, I don't know what, what the data would show because I do believe those are five acre parcels up uh, along that ridge up there. I would, I would just note, because I've spent two years looking for a piece of land for the Children's Literacy Foundation, and there are no commercial properties up there. Uh, pretty much all the commercial properties that are available now are now along you know, the main streets and along through um, Waterbury Center itself. There's, I don't think if, you, if you're worried about the Worcester Range and up to the Callan kind of projects, nothing is commercial up there. And that, and that would be then, if my knowledge is correct, if housing projects over a certain amount, even if they're less than 10 acres, are still subject to that 50 review. Or well, we're on. Sounds like you put. Yeah, because we're only right. talking about commercial. Yeah, this, that's correct. Right. This, would not, this would not impact any uh, residential properties. Uh, the, that threshold already changed, as I mentioned right. before. So this is uh, strictly the, the commercial project. So we don't have an inventory. There, there are plenty of parcels in our commercial districts that are in this one to 10 acre range. The, the pace of the development of those parcels is, you know, is relatively slow. We've basically had two projects um, over the last five years. Um, one built the Paros gun shop that um, this ordinance required them to go through Act 250 and then and now Duncan's project. So the, the pace is, is relatively slow. We don't, I, I don't anticipate a flood of projects if you repeal this ordinance, but they may very well occur. So there, there is definitely some, if you think of it as a, a, as a risk. So that could happen. Thanks, Steve. Yep. So Mike? Yes, Chris. So I, I um, agree with Steve's last, last comment there that I was gonna say, you know, the fact that no activity or little or none has taken place thus far doesn't mean that there wouldn't open the floodgates if we allowed the, you know, this change to take place without any any guidelines or any more guidelines than we already have on it. Is there a way of structuring said project as a residential project uh, and then after construction and this is I'm just throwing this out there uh, and then apply for a change in use or is that not possible on this particular scenario and would and would allow us more time to maybe implement some regs pertaining to the concerns that everybody's brought to the table tonight. Well I think any any site that allows um, Commercial use can can have a change of use from residential to commercial. So, I, I don't think this this ordinance uh, really has has a bearing on on somebody who may want to develop something residentially, and then um, if they change it to commercial, then it may it may have some some bearing. So, uh, no, I I think uh, you know if if you decide to repeal this and. Um, want to request that the Planning Commission address this um, issue, we can certainly bring that to the Planning Commission and, uh, and see if that can be made a priority, but yeah. um, that, that's fine. But I, don't, I, don't, I think this is pretty straightforward. It will, it will affect certain sites in, in a pretty prescribed way. Anyone else have further comments? If not, what is the board's pleasure? It's a, it's a difficult, difficult topic. Well, we still have. Okay. May I make one more comment, Mike? Right? Sure. My last comment to the, to the question of whether this is going to open the floodgates doesn't sound reasonable to me just because there are so many other towns in Vermont that have already have done this. So it's not like Waterbury is going to be the only town that has 10 acres zoning. You're going to be one of many now. So I don't think it's going to open any floodgates at all. What it is going to do is make it simpler for those who are trying to go through this process not to have to go through this extra uh, layer of examination and, and consideration, all of that. But 
It's not like people who could have gone to any of our neighboring towns who are in the same situation are suddenly going to come here. I mean, they have lots of other choices too. It's just going to even the playing field. I think that's what it's going to do. It's not going to open any floodgates, as far as I can tell. Your your comments aren't falling on deaf ears, uh, Duncan, because I've been waiting for months for permits of my own project. So I know exactly what you're going through, buddy. <laughs> okay, so. The, um, do you have the verbiage if we want to make it? Sure, I'll just give it to you. It's underlined there. It's very simple. Motion to repeal. That same thing as the agenda item. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I move to repeal the Town of Waterbury Ordinance regarding Act 250 review designation. Fair second. I second it. There's a motion and a second. Further <clears throat> discussion. Uh, call the question. Those in favor of um, repeal of the Town of Waterbury Ordinance regarding Act 250 uh, review designation in favor of the repeal, say aye. 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 Chris and Katie. Mm. <laughs> I don't have enough information yet. Um, I'm going to have to say nay at this time. Katie. Aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. So there are three ayes and one nay. The motion passes. And there can be a petition for the people from inside. Right. Okay. And I think that's if. There is I'm sorry, petition. I see it. If there is a petition, you know, we'd be gladly. I think it's something that the town people can, can speak to if they think this was, this was something that we did in error. And we would love to hear that, uh, those comments. Thank you all for your, for your very thoughtful comments on this issue. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, manager's items. Uh, Bill, capital equipment purchases. Okay, um, we have two of them to talk about tonight. I gave you some information in the um, agenda, Steve. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, so, in our capital plan for this year, we propose to um, replace one of our uh, bucket loaders, and we had $150,000 in the budget, as I indicated. Uh, the loader was ordered, uh, it was just a little short of $116,000. And uh, we were supposed to get the loader in October, and the loader is not going to arrive until January at the earliest now. Um, and because we won't have the loader, uh, the spending will have to be in 2022 when we, when we buy it. Um, so Celia and Bill Woodruff have approached me and said, you know, uh, next year's budget uh, included, uh, which haven't, hasn't been passed yet, but the, the schedule for capital equipment purchases included uh, the purchase of a new excavator in 2022. And uh, that excavator is uh, a little less than $88,000, so it's less than the 150 that we budgeted this year. So it would make sense, I think, to go ahead and, and flip-flop these. Um, the town does not specifically vote for particular pieces of equipment or particular capital projects. We typically put in the town report, this is what we think we're gonna spend it on. Um, if you look at the town report this year for paving, it says, Stowe Street. Uh, we decided not to do Stowe Street. We did Blush Hill instead because we got a grant for Stowe Street and it's just going to be easier to do that next year. So this is not unprecedented. If the, if the excavator was going to cost more than the loader, then I would feel a little bit more of a pause to say, I'm not sure you should do that, but it's, it's less. <laughs> I sent out this afternoon or this morning, I can't remember which, um, a comparison of the specifications for the, the uh, 
excavator that we currently have and what we're proposing to buy. Uh, the 2021 Volvo is a little bit bigger than the one that we have now. Um, and uh, I know Chris had expressed concerns about that before. Um, the public works director and the, and the uh, highway superintendent, Celia uh, Clark, don't feel that we want a full-size big excavator. Uh, this is something that we use on our streets and the ditches, and we don't want to necessarily have to block the whole road with it. So we're not looking for a huge excavator that, say, you know, Chris would have for his for his large projects. They believe that this 2021 Volvo uh, will meet our needs uh, for years to come. So that's my proposal on uh, the excavator versus the loader. And what will happen is, if you approve this, we'll buy the, the excavator now. Um, last we checked, the excavator is available. You know, we've got all these supply chain issues. That's what the problem with the loader is. Uh, if we buy the excavator now, hopefully it's still where it was last week when I sent this out and we can get timely delivery within a few weeks. Um, the loader will then be in next year's capital plan. So in the grand scheme of things, we're going to spend the same amount of money, uh, just in a little bit different order than we would have. Chris, you're the resident expert on heavy equipment. What, what were your concerns? Well, knowing the machine she had before and, and hearing comments from you know, some of the staff, um, difficulty in loading the trucks um, because it just is, doesn't have quite, you know, just, just enough reach to load the trucks. Um, and I wasn't suggesting maybe that she get something as big as the stuff that I've got, but uh, something big enough to load a truck uh, adequately, but yet small enough to not take up the whole road. Um, the zero turns today, um, basically the cab and and uh, um, you know the cab stays within the parameters of the tracks. Um, and on some of those smaller, I mean, that machine she's getting now or the one she's requesting to get is just a few hundred pounds heavier than the other one. Uh, I looked at the specs on it. There is, you know, some, some uh, reach and big depth differences. Um, not a heck of a lot of difference. Uh, I don't know if the if uh, another machine up. See, Bill Woodruff had actually asked me at one point there. We were supposed to kind of get together on this and and look at it, but we never were able to connect. Um, I just wanted to make sure that she had something that was adequate to. And I know she does do some stuff that gets in in some tight spots, so a smaller machine is obviously better for that. Um, but I think, I think you did, this machine is, did she rent a similar machine to the one that she's requesting, Bill, this year? I think so, Chris, yes. Chris, is this, I'm trying to get a handle on, I know it's not one of those real small excavators. So this, just maybe fill in the blanks. I know it's not a full-size excavator. So, so so my my what I call my mini excavator, getting inside the cabs like getting in a telephone booth. Um, it's the same, about the same weight as the Yanmar, the eleven thousand pound machine. Um, Which is what we have now. Okay. Yeah, and, and I have difficulty loading my little one ton dump, dump truck with it. Um, so I just thought that something having something a little bit bigger. I don't, I don't know what the next steps up in the Volvo series are. Um, Bill Celia, Celia feels this is adequate. Celia and Bill both feel that this is what they need. 
Okay. Um, I'm not an expert, I understand. I mean, we've run the 2010 Yanmar for a number of years. Uh, Celia likes it. Uh, they've been able to get the trucks filled. Maybe it takes a little bit more manipulating. She does a lot of work out there, you know, by herself, and then the trucks come later and, and get filled. You know, we can, I don't, if we say no, then we're not gonna buy anything this year. We're gonna have to buy two things next year or the year after. And, you know, I'm not an expert on this. All I know is that Celia and Bill Woodruff said, this is what we should buy. So. Okay, my opinion, we gotta trust our yeah, folks' I'm judgment. Yeah, I'm gonna know better than they know, so. I, I, I respect, yeah. you know, Chris's point, but if, if these folks feel this is gonna work for them, I have, especially with these old these supply chain issues, I think we're crazy to. Yeah, well, so, to some of these things I didn't right. notice, I didn't notice until tonight, they're kind of hard to figure out. Like where it says dig depth, mm -hmm. 12 feet, nine and a half inches on the 10, 2010 Yanmar, that's understandable. The other one is 13 feet, 13 inches. So that's like, what, 14 feet, one inch, right? The ground clearance is the same, one foot, and, 22 inches. <laughs> and uh, the ground reach, 20 feet, I think it's 20 and three quarter feet is what that really is. Okay. So, oh, but anyway, um, I don't have a real skin in this game one way or the other. I think that Celia and Bill feel that this is a good deal for us. Um, Do you need a motion for yeah. us to approve this? I, I assume so. Is there a motion to approve this purchase? No moved. Purchase of what? Um, 2021 yeah. Volvo. 2021 Volvo ECR 58F. Excavator. There's a motion. Katie has seconded it. Any further discussion? If no, yeah, uh, I, just no to, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I wasn't protesting the, the consideration to buy this. In fact, that's why I asked if Celia had rented one because it, obviously she did. She knows full well what she can, yeah. can, can't do with that machine. So uh, without, without the opportunity of me being involved in looking at the different types of machines, I can't dispute uh, Bill and her recommendation to buy it. So, okay. Thanks, Thanks for that, well, Chris. Any further discussions? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Staff the, no, we still got one more um, equipment purchase oh, right. to talk yeah. about. Come up to the table. Yeah. Nick. So. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, we broached the subject of um, another uh, van for the recreation department. And um, we talked about, okay, we can buy it now. We don't have specific authority to buy it. Uh, we certainly have had, um, we're a much better budget position than we dreamed we were gonna be in when we put the budget together this year. Not only are we receiving full payments on pilot and, and um, forest and parks pilot and current use that we had budgeted about a third of what we were gonna get. Um, the recreation uh, fees that we've collected this year are significantly higher. And we also got a grant of, uh, well, two grants from, from Shaw's, Albertsons, uh, for a total of $70,000. The first $10,000 grant was specifically for the van that we already purchased that was in the budget at town meeting. The second grant for $60,000 was to run a feeding program basically with some other things. Um, Nick did a good job with that and uh, you know not only uh, was able to purchase food from local restaurants to give them business but to feed our uh, whole recreation program for the, for the whole summer and still have some money left over, right? Yep. And um, Albertsons, Shaw's would like us to spend the full $60,000 in 2021. Uh, if we go into next year, 2022, to buy this van, 
we can get voter approval for it specifically, but we won't have the $10,000. So I'm going to turn things over to Nick right now because there is a specific ban that he's talking about. So go ahead. And I think, Chris, sorry you don't have his memo. He didn't give it to me until just uh, before the meeting tonight. I think the rest of the board has it. No, not yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's um, somehow Bill asked me to type a paragraph, and I'm taking after him more and more now these days and going with extreme detail. But um, right, we purchased that van in early 2021 with Albert's grant, and um, when we purchased, it's a 2017 with 50,000 miles, basic model. It was $26,000. And that was hard to find. I had to jump on that within two days to get it after you know looking for a few months. Um, since late summer, we, we really noticed throughout the summer, as I mentioned in the last meeting, that we've outgrown this van already. I um, was looking for another one. And you know normally I would wait until next year to um, propose this as a, as a capital improvement uh, purchase. But um, we have to spend this $10,000 by the end of the year by Shaw's. Um, the extension process is kind of inexistent. It's not really non-existent. They're, they've never gone through that process before and they're not, they don't seem very um, keen to that idea. So they really want us to spend it uh, this year, which is why there's a little bit of a, of a, of a push. Additionally, as the shortages of everything um, for, for goods, has, has impacted us. Uh, it's also impacted dealerships and um, used car prices. So uh, there, I've been searching right since late summer. There hasn't really been any vans in the area. How people are getting vans right now is they're calling dealerships and asking you to put on a list, and the dealer will call when that they're on the list next for the van. So it doesn't even hit the site. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, I did that, and there's a van that's being held right now in. At, uh, Lamoa Valley Ford, uh, they're awaiting the outcome of this meeting. Um, it's much nicer, it's a, you know, same 15 passenger van we have, but it's much nicer. It's, a, it's got a high roof, um, it's got an extended cargo space, it's a dually, it's got more um, capacity to carry equipment and whatnot. Um, and it's, you know, it was 48,000. I've talked them down to 40,000 just because they're hoping to get municipal business in the future. Is it yours? It's used. It's a 2019, but it only has 17,000 miles on it, and it has a 100,000 mile um, powertrain warranty. So the transmission goes, uh, whatnot. It's covered just because the previous uh, owner of that van had purchased that, and it carries over. Um, that's really expensive to buy with a new, new van for the, you for the dealership. The previous owner was. No, I haven't. I haven't asked that far, but um, I, we went up and checked it out, and uh, it, it's it's in really nice condition. I was just curious if it was like a recreational person or just a, or a commercial. Yeah, I think it was a bike from the salesman. He didn't really understand, he didn't really know off the top of his head, but it, it seems like it's a it was a bike like a bike tour. Okay. Uh, they had it outfitted for a trailer and, and can it accommodate handicapped uh, people? No, no, uh, handicapped vans. You know, I know how, how we would do it for our program is if we had a handicapped person that, that needed an accessible van, we would rent one. So our program would be inclusive. Um, this van can't do that because it would take up almost all the seats. The, the okay. Handicapped vans um, don't really have passenger seats in it. It's usually just meant for wheelchairs. Um, handicapped buses are big enough where they can have space for, for a handicap, like a, like a wheelchair and then, and then seats. So, yeah, this van is, um, I, you know, chopped them down. For what it is, it's a deal. Uh, it's the only van in the area for this price. Um, you know, I've reached out to as far as, as uh, Philadelphia. Um, you know, Bill Woodruff and I were talking about having to go on a road trip to get a van. Um, so, uh, this is, this is a, a good deal. It's a... Bill and I kind of came up with a number of 40,000 and that's what I was able to talk them down to. Um, 10,000 of that is covered by the grant, so it would be 30,000 put on. Uh, I've talked to dealerships about ordering a van um, and right now there's just, uh, the Ram dealer told me they ordered one of their vans and it, it's on back order until next June 
and they ordered it in May. So uh, it would be, yeah, it's just, it's been difficult to find a van. So we're, we're next on the list for this one. And, uh, and it's, it's up to you guys to decide if we do it. I guess I will talk about expenses real quick and revenues um, because that helps. So we budgeted, we projected we'd spend 32,000 or $325,015 for this year. Um, we're, as of today, we're $2,000 under that. We're obviously gonna go over it, but not by, not by a ton. Um, our revenues we projected were gonna be 164,000. Uh, we've generated $279,000 in revenue. So um, both of the expenses and expense and the revenue include that $60,000 grant. So even though we spent $50,000 of that grant, we are still under our budget for uh, what we projected we would spend uh, this year for recreation programs. Um, and we are, you know, that puts us at $115,000 more revenue than we projected. So the purchase of this van and four of them would, would not, you know, if we wanted to, would not, um, or three of them would not put any additional stress on the budget for the taxpayers. So from a budgetary standpoint, this is a no brainer. We've, we've got the money. Um, I think without going into great details, the likelihood that having the van can help generate additional revenues in the future is something that Nick and I have talked about already. Um, but I don't want to gloss over the fact that this was not approved by the voters. And if, you know, if the board feels any discomfort about that, uh, we certainly respect that and understand it. I think you can, um, you know, the old saying, it's whatever, better or easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. I think you could explain this to most voters and most of the voters would say you did the right thing. There's always going to be somebody that says, eh, you really should have come to us first. So we're not trying to put you in a difficult position. If the answer is no now, uh, we'll certainly accept that. Uh, we'll budget for it, um, and then you get to decide ultimately whether you want to put it in the budget or not, and then the voters can choose next year to do it. Understand that if we do that, there's a likelihood that we won't have the van for next year's summer season if we wait until April to order, because that's typically what we would do is wait for 30 days past town meeting before we would make the order. And we would also um, lose that 10000 And then the 10000 right, right. would would lose out on that. Having said this, we have in the past, um, it's a little bit different because we've put together budgets that have been sent to the printer and we're, we know what we're going to be asking the voters for. But, you know, last year, you know, we ordered some capital things before we actually had the vote. It was in the budget, and you know, we, we have ordered things in January because of long lead time and the like. So it's, this is not unprecedented to do this this way, but uh, we do understand and appreciate that this has not been vetted, and you know, everybody except Lisa and Elizabeth are <laughs> gone now. So. Uh, you know, there's, been there's nobody watching. Much outcry in uh, things that have happened like this in the past? No, not typically. I mean, somebody might ask the question right. and it gets explained at town meeting, right. and we tell them, well, we had this opportunity um, and we've done it. I, I think, you know, the. I, I'm not. I know Albertsons has said that they'd like us to spend the money this year. Um, if we say no to this now, is there something else we can spend $10,000 on? I don't know. I haven't talked to Nick yet. We'd try to spend the yeah. money, but whatever we bought for that $10,000 would not have been in the budget either, you know, right. because we didn't right. really know about this grant until right. after the budget year, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, or did we know about it? No, it was after it was after town meeting day that we got it awarded in early June. So, so anyway, uh, thank you, Nick and Bill, for your eloquent description of the problem of the issue.
Or is it, uh, does the board get it? Um, so the senior center had used your last fan. Yes. Are you are you going? Are you anticipating letting them use this one if we do purchase it? I see that it's uh, ha has more space and has a higher top. So is that? Yeah, I put that in there because we rent we rented our van out. On you know we use it every week. It's we put on a thousand miles roughly every month so far with it. So it's definitely getting used. Um, we rented it out to a few different um, organizations. You know, our insurer if. If we rent it out to someone who doesn't have insurance, like isn't going to be putting on their insurance, then a municipal employee has to drive it. So we rented it to the senior center, and uh, Bill Woodruff, the town employee, drove it. Uh, that was difficult for adults to get in. It's a low roof. It's a base model, like I mentioned before. It's perfect for kids, right? They, the booster seats fit fine. It's 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 great um, for adults. It's tighter. We could still use it for adults, but as we piloted with the senior center, it's it's not the best. Uh, this van is bigger, right? It's, an, it's a heavy duty, it's HD, it's got a little bit bigger of a, of a chassis. Um, it, the seats are a little bit wider and the high roof makes it so you don't have to duck around. Like I've, I've gone in our van and I can do it because I'm, I'm nimble, but putting some car seats, right? You're like hunched over trying to do it. I feel like a, you know, a mom or something. So, um, yeah, this van's much bigger. It's, Us old folks would appreciate the yeah, extra space. Right, right, right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and then additionally, right, it has more cargo space too. So when we do yeah. do, you know, the potential trips for the van would be camping trips in the summer and whatnot, we'll have that space to put the kids' stuff and take the kids. Um, I wonder, just from um, a transparency standpoint, if rather than just letting it happen and people find out about it, if we may get a really positive announcement when it happens and, and be really clear and let the public know about it because I, I think it's a huge asset to the program. The oh, program we, wouldn't, has. we wouldn't hide it. Well, and, and I don't mean that. I just mean like to, to take it a step further. To yeah, I can make a promo. Or or yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisa could put something <laughs> in the uh, in the paper. Oh, I'm sure and I, think that'd be a, I think the community would rally around that. that why why waste the $10,000? Yeah. and? It's something yeah. that will add to the program. I mean, the feedback for our first van purchase was great, right? There wasn't a single person that said, why do you need that? Like, even our highway guys were like, cool, you got a that. van. So, <laughs> you always have a few curmudgeons that, yeah. that don't like to spend much money. Bill's on record as saying, when he got rid of his car, that the rec department needed a van. So, <laughs> you can dispute that. But, um, no, it was really, there was, it was very positive for the first van. Uh, I've talked to the rec committee about our, our need for another van. Um, they're excited that this is an opportunity, uh, but I you know, like understanding that we are presenting something that wasn't originally uh, approved by taxpayers to purchase. Uh, even though this won't have any stress on them for this fiscal uh, year, you know, it's that is a true that is a true. Uh, any other questions okay. by any of the select board? Mm -hmm. if, if not, I would entertain a motion to approve this purchase. <coughs> So moved. Second. So I need to state it more clearly. Yeah, probably. Okay, you got it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a motion, a second. Did I hear? Yeah. Okay, I thought I heard that, but I just wanted to make sure. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There being none, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Chris, you're on mute, just so you know, bud. <laughs> You, you in favor, Chris? <laughs> Chris, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say if, 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 if for some reason we decide that it's a bad move, we could just unload it, right? Get most sure. or all of what we yeah, need for it out of that probably, uh, I suspect. Yeah, we'll so get more money out of it. I don't have any issue. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I know from purchasing a new truck to say this summer. It's crazy with trying to get vehicles yeah. nowadays. Absolutely. If this doesn't work, I have a I have a cousin who sells for it, so you might be able to uh, get get something through. Okay, where? <laughs> it's uh, in Patchogue, New York. That's not too bad. I contacted a guy in Indiana because that was the next closest dealership that was able to. to I'm sure. Work. I'm sure he would try to do something. Just book. Yeah. We did. We did. We did. We did. We did. Okay. And I, just, you know, like, I didn't realize. Deals. I didn't realize you're a doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That just happened well, last month. You know, 
Can you wave the staff reports? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, we'll fill in the staff report. <laughs> All right, good. Um, oh, good staff that. reports. Yeah, you're good, but you're staying. <laughs> so, a um, couple things. First, uh, Mike stole my thunder. I oh, guess Mike did. Sorry, I'm having to put his title in there. So uh, Nick has just been awarded a uh, doctorate degree from the uh, Liberty University. Uh, he has, his capstone project was this, recommendations for improving staff responses to disruptive behavior in summer recreation program at the town of Waterbury, Vermont. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Nick, when he was hired here, he, he had you received your master's degree already? I, just, I, just yeah, about. Just right? about, yeah. And uh, he told me he got his master's degree and he said, I'm going to go get my doctorate now. And I laughed at him and said, sure, <laughs> we'll see. Sure you and, you know, like two years later, he's, he's got a doctorate degree. So it's pretty impressive. And congratulations to you, yeah, thank you Dr. Nato. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm going to read this. Okay. I have a pain in my knee. Can you do anything about that? Not that type of thought. <laughs> um, in addition, um, and this isn't like drag on Nick Day, but um, he did, he has received a couple of awards, and I don't know what I did with the first one, the second one here. So this, this plaque was given by Vorec, right? Yeah, cool. And, um, and then, where's the other one there? So the Governor's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities, uh, most of you were on the board uh, either when or shortly after we were sued for um, having uh, somebody claim that our programs were not accessible to someone with uh, um, emotional disability. Uh, we've always tried to be available for um, for physical disabilities, but we've had challenges with that. But anyway, uh, Nick was nominated by um, Voc Rehab Vermont 2021 Spirit of the ADA Award, and um, he has been awarded this. Can you tell um, me what it's called again? Yeah, it's the 2021 Spirit of ADA Award um, to Nick Nato and the town of Waterbury, and it's for basically for um, making our organization, the Recreation Department in particular, um, fully accessible, right? Yeah, not just the participants, right? Like the people who we hire to you know, employ, like more, you know, the town does it, in general has that statement, but we put that into work with some of the employees that we employed this summer. Um, and, and that are employed currently right now with the after school program. So it came out of left field and I see it coming. Either so Nick, Nick was hired right after, maybe you were even here already when the lawsuit was filed against us? I, I, as I worded, I inherited a lawsuit that I didn't know was happening. Um, but yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we, we fought that and, and we were. Um, not happy that we were uh, subject to that suit. But when Nick was hired, I talked to him about, you know, we need to do training of staff, and he's done that. Nick has some background with, uh, with Howard Family Services, I think it is. Howard Center. Howard Center. And, and have, you know, gone out of his way to provide training to our staff to, to how to deal with people with both physical and emotional disabilities. So. It's a huge step, and I just wanted to recognize him publicly for, for that. I, you're the man, Nick. <laughs> I just want to say in behalf, I'm sure I speak in behalf of the entire select board, you are a highly valued member of our town team. And I always look at it, we're part of the team, and we all need, we all work together and try to do what's best for this community. And you're such an asset 
to the the rec program has been so much better since you know you've been here, and I hope you, you know, we see you continue. Uh, I appreciate things. that. Yeah, I'm sure I'm speaking for my own fight for the other select board. There's a good foundation that that father laid for him, and he's certainly built up on that. This award, this is just a piece of paper. Uh, there will actually be a, I guess it's going to be a virtual ceremony <laughs> yeah. uh, instead of an in-person ceremony, but there will be something more coming along for that, right? Yep. Good. So, Thanks for setting a good example. Congratulations. Standard. Congrats. Thank you. Do you want me to take both of these, Bill? Yeah, you can take them. Hi, Mom. I don't need them now. Did you find enough people to work your uh, Thanksgiving Day break camp? Oh, yeah. We kind of work. If you need me, you can come by and bake. If you're looking for volunteer opportunities, we're talking about volunteer. Oh, my. Okay. We move on to consider authorizing an attorney to act for the town in the matter of property transfer from EPUD to the town. Right. So, um, very simply, the board met with EFUD, talked about those four properties that EFUD would like to transfer to the town. Uh, the select board has indicated its willingness to, to do so. Um, you know, there needs to be title work, there needs to be deeds drawn up. And the, the uh, most efficient and cheapest way to do that is to allow the same attorney to work both for EFUD and the town. It's basically, there's no, real consideration being asked for by EFUD, you're not having to pay them, there's no negotiations, it's already been kind of laid out, the only thing that EFUD is asking for is the ability to uh, have four employees work in this building without being charged rent, they already more or less do that. Now, so, <laughs> um, did you get the, um, the, yeah, so somebody, if you're okay with that, if somebody would make that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, given the nominal consideration already negotiated between the parties in the matter of the transfer of four properties from the Edward Ferrar Utility District to the Town of Waterbury, and understanding the same firm will represent the Edward Ferrar Utility District in the transaction, I move to engage the law firm Stitzel, Page, and Fletcher to represent the town in these transactions. Do we have a second? Second it. Thank you. There's been a motion, a second. Any further discussion on the motion? I don't see any issues. Sitzel and Page is a wonderful, I think they can refer, I also see very little conflict in this issue and I have no problem with them representing both EFUD and, and the panel. If there's nothing further, all in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, all, everyone's in favor, no opposed. Motion passes. D, inflation and resulting pressure on the budget. Yeah, so back in April, um, I presented to the board um, uh, wage and salary ranges for employees. Um, and you approved that and uh, authorized me to make, uh, to provide wages, uh, raises uh, that were in line with the budget. Um, at the time, the inflation rate was still in the two and a half percent range. If you read the news last week, it's about six and a half percent now. Uh, public works departments in particular in our region and across the state uh, to a lesser degree, but in our region, uh, are coming under uh, pressure, wage pressure. A, there's, like in every profession, uh, they can't find people to fill positions. I, I drove back home from Georgia uh, over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, in Pennsylvania and New York. They've got electronic message boards. Department of Transportation needs plow drivers, you know, please apply online, whatever. Um, I know VTrans here in the state is having difficulty with it. Um, so I took some action a couple weeks ago uh, and uh, made some temporary wage 
increases in the highway department. Um, and um, I would like to make those permanent. Um, and I would like to be able to, so in our region, the city of Montpelier has just negotiated a, a new public works contract. Uh, the base pay levels about 5% increases, and then you get all the steps and grades in there, and you know, it, significant increases. The city of Barrie, is, if they haven't ratified already, they are also in uh, contract negotiations. Um, we have surrounding communities that are trying to hire people, and we've got people who are working for us who are saying, well, if I can go somewhere else for more pay. Um, the folks who are on the lower end of our highway uh, and public works extends to, to EFUD for water and sewer, but that's not your problem. The folks who are on the lower end of our scale really, um, they need to come up a little bit more. So what I would like to do is to, um, to make permanent the, the, what I've already done. It's about $30, $30 a week for people right now, 75 cents an hour. And then um, probably uh, for a couple of them, make some additional changes before the end of the year. And then when we do the budget in April, there'll probably be some more changes. I don't think the, the range that I've presented to you in April, don't think I have to change that. It's just that people, especially at the bottom end, they're gonna have to come up a little bit. Um, I know it puts pressure on the budget. Um, as I said before, we're in a good budget position right now. I know every year is different. There's other challenges. But uh, I, I believe I have the authority already to do it, but I want to be transparent with the board to let you know what's going on. And I really don't, in open session, I don't want to get into specifics about how much and who and things like that. And uh, uh, there's no real, um, you're not really evaluating anybody's performance, so there's no real opportunity to go into executive session. Um, the highway budget this year, even though the, we've got like seven weeks left in this year, so it's, it's not gonna significantly impact the wage line. I can't promise that the wage line will not go above what we budgeted, but it's not gonna go above by 10%. You know, it's a budget, uh, you know, we're usually within a couple percent one way or the other of budget. So that wage line may go above what was budgeted for the wage line alone. The highway budget itself, the bottom line, uh, and unless we get a really, really wintry uh, November, half of November and December, uh, the highway budget is going to come out in good shape. So. Um, I don't need any, any action by the board, but if you have comments or concerns or want to tell me no, you need to make a motion to say, I can't do what I want to do. So. Do you have any, I'm not asking for anyone specific, but are there any rumblings of people looking at leaving or? Oh yeah, there have been. Okay. Uh, and I, you know, I, I can't say. Uh, I know you can't say, say. who. And, you know, uh, we talked, we talked to, if you remember, probably back in May, that, you know, if there were retirements from the highway department, maybe we wouldn't fill all the positions. So just because somebody might want to go, but the problem is, is that, you know, the, the people who are, long-term veterans and who are at the higher end of the scale, they're not the ones that are looking to go. It's the people that, you know, are kind of up and coming that would be the ones. And if you lose them, right. and then somebody you know, retires down the road, then you, you're kind of, you know, your transition plan kind of gets shot, so. I, I, I think we may have addressed this, but 
Are we, are our pay scales competitive with surrounding towns? Yeah, pretty much so. Um, I didn't bring it with me, but the LCT just did a salary survey. Right, just Rebel came out. Just came out about a month and a half ago. Was published and released about a month and a half ago. We are certainly in the range of average and median and the like. But as I said, if you look at the people who are at the low end of our scale, right. they're significantly lower than than some of those averages. So. Anyone have any questions about it? Chris, any questions? You got nothing to say, no. No. Great. We're good then. Great. E, penalty of late filing. Right. So, we have on your tax bill, if you remember it from um, when you had to pay it a week or so ago, two weeks ago, um, we have the 8% penalty and the 1% or 1.5% interest that is imposed if you're late making your payment. Nobody likes it when, when they get it, but we can easily justify it and, and just say, hey, that's the way it goes. There's another penalty that is not as transparent, and it's frankly so untransparent that we often forget to talk about it when we set the tax rate. So we have two tax rates, right? There's the non-residential tax rate, and then there's the residential tax rate. And for those of us who own homes, you know that you're supposed to file a declaration of a homestead if, if you live in your home uh, for the requisite number of days a year. Mm -hmm. And um, if you file that, that homestead declaration, two things happen, or could happen. One, your tax bill is going to have the homestead tax rate applied to the value of your property. And two, if your income is such, you might be eligible for a state payment that reduces reduces your tax bill. Um, when Act 60 and Act 68 were first uh, put in place, the homestead tax rate was typically lower than the non-residential. Now in most Vermont towns, it's flip-flopped and the homestead tax rate is higher than the non-residential. And Waterbury is that in that situation. So there's a a law on the books that says that if you uh, fail to file a homestead declaration and you live in a homestead, or if you, uh, I won't go into the or because we're talking about homesteads here, that uh, a penalty will apply. And if you don't file your home, uh, and if you have Failed to file a homestead, and it would would be uh, non-beneficial when you file that. You get a three percent, up to a three percent penalty. We have asked the legislature for a long time. The reason why they put these penalties in place is because if somebody files a homestead declaration late, the state sends a download to Dan Sweet, our assessor and he has to make some changes, and then he has to give it to Michelle Ryan, the, the uh, bookkeeper, and she has to make some changes, and then Karen Petrovich, the tax clerk, gets involved, and we have to produce a new tax bill. Now, it doesn't cost us, if, if your tax bill is, if your education property tax is $5,000, and you get an 8% penalty because you failed to file on time, well, 8% of $5,000 is, you know, 400 bucks. It doesn't cost us $400 to print a new tax bill. We did this uh, uh, calculation today, and we figured that about uh, a 2% penalty would, would do the trick in terms of how much it costs us to do this. And the funny part of it is, is that 
they've put this in place because they're trying to prevent people from fraudulently either filing or not filing to get the benefit of the lower tax rate, right? But if you file late, you're clearly not trying to defraud us. You, you've admitted, well, hey, I, I live in a homestead. Here's my declaration. Oh, it's late. You're, you're not trying to get away with anything. You filed it. So what I would like the board to do is to uh, retroactively uh, change. Because we took new, no action in July when we set the tax rate, we defaulted to the 8% penalty for people who didn't file a homestead on time and a 3% penalty for those who, who uh, would have gone the other way. If, 2% is plenty for us. For both? Yeah, for, for make it the same for both. Because it, we're talking about printing a new tax bill one way or the other. And what we did, uh, Dan and I worked together, figured out that the average assessment for residential property in town is about $350,000. And if you go through the machinations and you multiply that by 2%, that covers our administrative time to do this. There's about 40 people that filed late, uh, most of whom got an 8% penalty. Uh, some of them got a 3% penalty. We'll have to, if you approve this motion, we'll have to make some refunds. But it just, I mean, I can talk to somebody and say, you didn't pay your taxes on time. It's clearly stated on the bill that this penalty applies and this interest applies. But there's nothing on the bill that talks about this, and there's really nothing even on your tax, your income tax bill, that tells you that you're going to get an 8% penalty if you don't file it on time. So I would ask the board to retroactively make the penalty for uh, late filing of homestead declarations 2%. But it does say clearly when you file your, ta your state tax return, and even if you need an extension, you really need to file that declaration right. by the tax deadline. And right. maybe, I know Lisa's out there listening, maybe she could put something in the paper, you know, the power of the press is important, that I understand people are late, and for various reasons, right. don't file. Just throw in that one page for them and yeah. do it. And we're, we're, you know, we're not waiting the penalty completely. Right. We're, there's still a consequence to their right. action. But this one just... But people don't realize that they're going to be criminalized. That's a, the problem. It's a huge penalty. It's um, a lot. And, and, and as I s thought about this over the weekend, I said, you know, the only people that are getting this penalty are people who didn't file their homestead declaration. And, and then they yeah. do. <laughs> right. The people who might really be trying to commit fraud and never file it, right? They don't, they don't get this penalty. So, right. two, if you That's make true. a motion to make the penalty on both sides two percent. In addition, is there a way to make it more clear the way that the late um, payment is clear? Because there, well, it's, well, really it's too, it's too late to print it on the tax bill. Yeah, I, in the future. The homestead declaration is supposed to be filed by May. Right. Sorry. Right. And Karen would like the motion to also include that the refunds be refunded to the taxpayer. Some of these payments were made through escrow companies, mm -hmm. and it's just very much Directly. cleaner and easier to, to refund the taxpayer, not the escrow company. It, these you. are not huge amounts. Thank you for that clarification, Carla. Do we have a motion to that effect? We do. <laughs> oh, just take it. Okay. Remember it all. We have, a, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Great. Any opposed? Thank you all. Motion passes. Ellen, would you all sign this liquor license, please? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of a little off script, but on, on behalf of the Waterbury Rotary, 
we we did a little garland hanging and the rotary, and they were giving away um, they were giving away uh, gift certificates for the um, for uh, prohibition pig and the end of the woods, et cetera. And I said, you know, there were a few left over. I didn't bring it today, but Bill, I advocated you're getting you're getting a gift certificate <laughs> for all the good work you do for the town. Oh, Anything else to come before us? If no, not, sir. a motion to adjourn is in order. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Adios. Thanks, Mark.